the, the more helpful it is. And of course, if you can, keep your faces on so that we can see one another. Uh, that always makes it better. All right, so I know that people are still coming in, but I want to at least begin by introducing our introducer so that we can get ourselves started. Uh, for those who may be new to the Lunch Together online program, this is something that we were running in person once a month at Temple um, and have shifted to once a week just because uh, you all keep showing up, which is wonderful. I think that as we are home over these weeks and months, we're really looking for ways to, uh, to engage, to see other faces, to engage with important speakers and ideas. Um, and this really is such a vitally, vitally important one as we've seen, um, unfortunately, not unfortunately, terribly, these awful racist incidents, especially involving police in these past few weeks and the really rising up of a movement or continuation of a movement to speak out against it. And for Temple is a place that's always cared deeply about social justice and community partnerships and uh, tikkun olam, as we call it, the repair of the world. Uh, this is an area where we, where we very much want to be engaged, but we also realize that uh, one thing we've got to do is we've got to listen and we've got to learn. That's two things, I guess, and there's plenty more on that list, but this is a place for us to, to at least begin. Um, so I'm so appreciative of Valerama Holness for agreeing to speak with us today. You'll hear more about him in a moment. And I am especially appreciative of our member, um, Brian Bronfman, who is the co-founder and president of the Peace Network for Social Harmony. Uh, next year's gala honoree, together with Marcia, who also is uh, deeply involved in the Peace Network, um, for really helping us make this connection and move forward on these issues. And so um, with deep gratitude, Brian, without any further ado, uh, I want to introduce you and ask you to introduce Valorama, and then we're going to dive right in. Thanks, Lisa. Absolutely. So well, I mentioned that the Peace Network for Social Harmony, um, our efforts are summed up by our new slogan, which is peace at the heart of our actions, strengthened by the power of collaboration. So it's all about that. And our members who are philanthropic foundations and businesses and our individual friends of the network are all dedicated to creating this more peaceful society. And a really big part of that, <clears throat> in fact, our number one mandate for several years now is celebrating diversity, encouraging inclusion, and relatedly fighting racism and discrimination. So for us, it's not just the flavor of the day. It's wonderful that people are looking at it so much now, um, given tragic circumstances but it's long overdue and we've been focusing on that for a long time it's a long-term effort it started years ago and it's going to last for us as long as it takes to create the society in which everyone feels respected and everyone is included and temple manual as uh, the rabbi just mentioned certainly shares these values and these goals it's in temple's dna and if it's what it's why my wife marcia and, and myself were proud temple members and we feel so at home there and the example is that spring fundraiser, which is delayed till next year because of COVID, which will be entitled Peace, Diversity, Inclusion, A Celebration of Shared Values. I love bringing people together to work for peace. And it's particularly exciting when people or when institutions who I care for and I admire come together. And that's really the case here. Uh, I've had wonderful partners that I've developed in diverse communities, including the black community. But when Rabbi Greshko and I were discussing and organizing for this event to look at the issue of racism, there was an obvious choice for the perfect speaker and that was Balarama Holmes. The, the moment I met Balarama several years ago now, I was impressed, I was excited. I, I couldn't wait to partner with him however I could. I came back, I remember the night I, I met him, I went back to Marcy and I said, Marcy, I've met the most amazing guy, we're gonna work with him for sure. Uh, so we've developed this great relationship and he is the reason why Montreal has held this inquiry into sy systemic racism. He's incredibly knowledgeable on the topic and we are really fortunate to have him here today. I'm gonna to read his bio now. So Balarama Holness is co-founder of Montreal in Action He's a social entrepreneur, a former football player, a teacher with a master's degree in education, and is currently completing a law degree from McGill University. 
His current work focuses on participatory democracy, constitutional law, and systemic discrimination related to employment, public security, the environment, culture, and so on. Currently, thanks to the work of Montreal in Action, for the first time in Montreal's history, public consultations on systemic racism and discrimination took place in which 5,000 Montrealers participated. Montreal in Action is now working with the City of Montreal and local stakeholders to implement the inquiry's recommendations in order to build a more equitable and inclusive city. So it's my pleasure and my honor to ask Valorama to speak to us and you're, you're so welcome to be here today, Valorama. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much, Brian, for the kind words and thank you uh, for the invitation uh, to Rabbi Lisa and as well, Brian, thank you so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, share some of the things I learned throughout my life. And I really hope that in this conversation, I can also learn from you. Um, as a teacher, one of the main objectives I have and one of the main philosophies is that you are not just receptacles of information. We can partake in some critical thinking, some dialogue, and see how we can come to solutions. And uh, before we begin, I have a short you know, story about myself uh, to let you know a little bit about where I'm from and how I approach the situation. So I was born in Montreal. Uh, my parents did not have a lot of money. However, our homes were filled with books, books to the brim. And education became the way that I was going to launch my positive revolution. I knew that I didn't have the resources to fully express myself in society. I knew that I didn't have the resources to possibly, you know, buy a car and have a home. And I felt though, as though education was the way in which I could really express myself and meet my fullest potential. So I set off on an educational journey and between my friends and I, I have a joke and I say, I have as many diplomas as Michael Jordan has championship rings. By the end of this year, I'll have six diplomas. Now, my critique of education, however, is that how do we ensure that what we learn in academia is implemented? If I am a mediator and I speak of peace, I wanna be able to enact that in real life, such as what Brian is doing. For someone like myself, I am interested in the Canadian Constitution and S15 of the Canadian Charter. So if we're all equal before and under the law, whether it's your citizenship, your ethnicity, your nationality, your sexual orientation, your religion, et cetera, it is my job to ensure that I ensure that my community and the people around me uphold the Canadian Constitution, maintain and fulfill it. So the presentation today is not just words on paper. These are things that I've myself worked on, my organization has worked on, and I hope that you after this presentation can also maintain peace, prosperity, and equality in Montreal and promote it. So without further ado, I wanna start on some basic fundamental principles about law, inclusion, and justice in the context of systemic discrimination and racism. The first important point I wanna to touch on is de facto versus de jure. Some people say de jure, I say de jure. Now, de facto is very much so, and actually it, it should be de jure, excuse me, first. De jure is very much so the overt, explicit expression of discrimination. So for example, Marie-Joseph Angelique, and pardon me, it should be de, de jour at the top. Marie-Joseph Angelique in 19, excuse me, in 1734, she is a slave woman in Montreal who is accused of burning down a home to flee from her slave owner. This happens right here in Montreal in the old port. It turns out that a home that she lives in gets burnt and it burns down half of old Montreal. And a little girl allegedly saw her burn down the home and she is brought in front of a court 
this slave woman, Marie Joseph Angelique. And the court says that she is guilty and condemns her to death. But before that, this slave woman here in Montreal is tortured. And we ask ourselves, how is it possible that slavery and torture happen right here in Montreal? Well, the answer is simple, is that in law, in within the British Empire, slavery was legal. And this was not just a factor south of the border. This was a reality right here in Canada, right here in Montreal. So that is an example of de jure, open, explicit bias and racism. Now I want to fast forward a little bit beyond that and take you up until 1939. This is a very important case because it explicitly shows you discrimination from a contemporary perspective, but once again, de jure, right in your face, scribed in law. So a young man by the name of Christie, after a Montreal Canadiens game, he ends up going to a tavern and asks for a beer. The tavern refuses service to this black man. He takes the tavern to court, all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court establishes that, indeed, right here in Montreal, that a tavern had the right to refuse a black man a beer after a Montreal Canadiens game in a tavern right here in your hometown. Surprising. So in Montreal in the 1930s, if you were a person of color, overtly in the Supreme Law of Canada in the highest court, a private enterprise can refuse to serve you a drink. And the other point I want to mention, and you probably recognize the name in section three here, the St. Louis ship. So there are Jewish people fleeing Nazi Germany and the Canadian government in 1939 refuses for the ship to be docked. This is not de facto, and once again, I pardon the mix up with the title, this is overt discrimination on specific people that is scribed in policy, scribed in law, and scribed in protocols. Now, that form of discrimination is very, very overt. It's very clear. And, the, and what makes it clear, and on the fourth point there, Lionel Gru, who the metro station is named after, as you all know, he was an active hate monger and anti-Semitic, openly. And that's one reason why people want to change the, the name of that metro station. So these are overt expressions of discrimination scribed in law and in policy and practices. That is the jure. Now, as we progress and we pass 1982, whereby the Canadian constitution is rendered more equitable through the insertion of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, now the supreme law of the land is such that you cannot discriminate based on someone's ethnicity, nationality, religion, etc. And now I'm going to give you a direct change the slide, a direct explicit example of how systemic discrimination is exercised through institutions in a de facto way. In other words, it is not going to be written overtly in a law, in a policy or practice or a handbook, excuse me. It simply, the result of the law is such that it has a disproportionate impact on particular individuals. And while this particular presentation is, does not address Bill 21, it is the simple example, is that the law in and of itself is, seems neutral, 
if you read the legislation, it doesn't target a specific person. However, it has a disproportionate impact on certain people in society, whether it's Muslim women, whether it's Jewish people, and, other, and, and so on and so forth. That is an example of de facto. Is de facto the result is such that it is discriminatory. Now, consider the following aspects you see on the screen, whether it's urbanism and land use planning, employment, inequality, sports and recreation, housing, racial and social profiling, culture, participatory democracy. All of these factors and elements of public life contribute in one way, shape, or form to systemic discrimination. Now, we don't have the time to go through all of them, but I'm going to touch on a few of them to give you an example of how systemic discrimination is exercised through institutions, policies, and practices. And I am going to add a twist to it at the end. So pay attention to the following. You are going to be quite surprised. Now, first things first, many of you have probably heard about the SPVM's treatment of racialized communities. So last year, there was a report by Victor Armini that established that the SPVM were four to five times more likely to intercept racialized communities, namely Arabs and Blacks, as well as Indigenous women. Indigenous women, it was 11 times more likely to be carded. Now, this is a serious issue for many reasons. Let's start by the first reason of the vicious cycle. As you can see, the SPM budget has increased by 33% over the last 10 years. Now it's above $600 million. And despite the fact that criminality in Montreal is low and stagnant, uh, Montreal police officers per capita are one of the highest in Canada, and it's 223 police officers per 100 people. And that's well above the, the national average. So what happens? Well, a police officer through implicit bias, and we all have implicit bias, will associate the color of someone's skin with criminality. This is done for many reasons, whether it is what you see on TV, whether it's what's spoken about in coffee shops, certainly in the media, and just everyday intercultural relations between people, people develop stereotypes and prejudices towards other groups. Now, the challenge is, if you're a police officer and you are over four or 5,000, and collectively there is implicit or systemic implicit bias on a certain group, well, there are going to be more carding and more interceptions on that particular group. So what happens? Areas with high density uh, spaces or high concentration of racialized people will get excessively surveilled. And when that happens, there is going to be more ticketing naturally. Therefore, there's a self-fulfilling prophecy and vicious cycle whereby the SPBM will say, I told you they were criminal. I told you their skin color is indeed associated with criminality. And what's going to happen is more resources will be added to that particular area. Henceforth, in Montreal North, in St. Michel, and other areas with high density populations of minorities, despite the fact that criminality is not necessarily higher, there's going to be more resources. And that is one particular problem within the current policies is that the more you surveil and the more you card, sorry, sorry, okay, sorry, I thought I heard a question. The more you surveil, the more you card, the more you're gonna end up intercepting these individuals. Now, there's a huge challenge to this, is that if I were to ask you, what's the mythical norm of Quebec? And take 10 seconds to think about what is the conception that you have of a 
typical person living in Quebec, a typical, what they call, what Audrey Lord calls the mythical norm. If you to think about that a little bit, you might think a Caucasian, possibly 40 years old, middle class, who speaks French, possibly bilingual, and that would be a person that fits the mythical norm here in Quebec. Now the issue is if you're outside that mythical norm, you're seen as other. So you wear a kippa. Someone might look at you different. You are dark skinned and you have a bigger nose. You don't fit that mythical norm. You might wear a veil. You don't fit that mythical norm. And people who don't fit the mythical norm are viewed with suspicion, not just in the police force, also within human resources, also within the cultural sphere, also within the democratic and political sphere. So profiling happens across the board. And in the, the pictures I have on screen there, these were the key indicators that the SPVM was using to identify criminality. So it's people with literally written bling bling. So if you had a nice car and you were a dentist and you were black, you were more likely to be intercepted because you fit this bling bling profile of being a person of color with a nice car and you're more likely to be intercepted. And this just didn't happen here and there interceptions increased or carding increased by 140% during the study that was indicated. And there were over 40,000 a year. So what, what, we're, what we're saying here is this isn't a one-off incident. This is happening on a systemic level across the board. Now, if I were to ask you something very simple, I said, what percentage of Black males have university diplomas. And if I were to ask you to compare that number or compare the number you have in your mind to the percentage of white males with university diplomas, and I were to ask you which one is higher or to establish a number, many of you, including myself, might think, well, white males have a higher graduation rate or higher, higher rates of diplomas than black males. Stats Canada came out with a study last February in light of Black History Month, and it's pretty much the same. A third of black males have university diplomas, and the rest of the population, in terms of male, have a third as well. It's, a, it's about two to three percentage differences, which means that Education is relatively even. So on, on the first hand, if you are educated and you're a person of color and you have a nice car, even having that education, being a lawyer and having a nice car and a home will not stop you from being stopped and carted by, by the police. Now, why is that problematic? Well, it ends up having, a, it becomes a health crisis. You're gonna feel a sense of anger and justice. You're gonna distrust the police. Stress and trauma, confusion, shock and fear. And we know that this is a health crisis because Centre came out with a study which indicated that there is 11 years difference in life expectancy right here in Montreal if we look at people of color, specifically in St. Michel and Montreal North, versus the rest of the population. So when we think about systemic discrimination, we also have to think about the health impacts, what many professors are now calling weathering. Weathering is a concept similar to your grade eight geography teacher, by the way, I am by, by training, I'm also a grade eight geography teacher on the side. Uh, and erosion is basically wind and sun and all these earthly elements that eventually erode at you. So imagine yourself go, doing all the right things. You, you go to school, you get a job, and when you're at your job, 
you suffer or you are, you are impacted by microtransgressions. People throw a joke at you, throw a joke here, throw a joke there. You might not get the raise that you want or the promotion that you want. When you turn on the, the television, people that look like you are associated with gangsterism. Your, your sons or daughters come back from school and tell you they don't see themselves in the curriculum or they're being bullied. And all of these intersecting factors have a huge, huge impact on the health of minority communities. And the same goes also with the Jewish community. We have seen a rise in hate crimes in the Jewish community. And I, I went to uh, the ceremony after the events in Pittsburgh here in Montreal, and it was hurtful. It was, it, it, it's not an easy life to lead if there is racism, anti -Semit excuse me, if there's anti-Semitic behavior in others that continuously, everywhere you turn, you end up facing these things. We, we say that we're strong, we have this moral resilience, but at the end of the day, it is a health crisis. And I think it should be seen as a health crisis. And that's why there are investments currently at the federal level in regards to mental health, but that it doesn't go far enough. And that's something that well after this course, uh, you can think about and even share thereafter is how could we approach these issues as a health crisis and how could we attempt to remedy them? And one last point on the issue of health. If you would ask yourself, where is the epicenter of the COVID-19 crisis in Canada? You would, you guess correctly, it's Montreal North. And the intersecting factors of poverty, of access to social services, of being on the front lines, having to work, and many of you have heard the crisis, it is individuals with precarious immigration statuses that have to work on those front lines. And all of those factors culminate together. And ultimately, it has egregious impacts on the life expectancy of people of color. So that is an important aspect to touch on and the health determinants, whether it's having a job or the socioeconomic standing or what we call health literacy, those are important points that we for sure certainly need to touch on, okay? And if you have any questions regarding the, the health section and this, you can always put it in the chat and we can answer it later. Now, I would say if you were to take uh, one element from this presentation, it would be the following. And I think that this is probably the toughest, mo most monumentous challenge that we have to tackle systemic discrimination across the board is, is the following. So the impact on health and culture excuse me, identity and culture. So the first quote is by Charles Taylor, who you all know very well. He says, identity is partly shaped by recognition or its absence, often by the misrecognition of others. When he says misrecognition, in other words, you can be a person of color portrayed by Hollywood as a gangster and a pimp and your identity and your black principle or brown principle or Jewish principle is being distorted. So a person or group of people can suffer real damage, real distortion, if the people or society around them mirror back to them a confining or demeaning or contemptible view or picture of themselves. What that means is the following. You can be a person of color and you are young and impressionable and you see rappers and gangsters on television and you're not aware that you come from an ancestors in Africa who were kings and queens and before and during World War II, your, your land was looted all the treasures from your land were taken back into museums 
and your history was completely erased and all you know now is what you see on television, your identity is just going to be distorted. Moreover, in the context of slavery, you're not viewed as being enslaved, a person with dignity who was enslaved, you're viewed as a descendant of a slave. It's very different. Your identity is then associated with slavery, as opposed to someone, a king or a queen, for example, and descendant from a beautiful enriched family with dignity, you, you are not seen as someone who was, who had that dignity. You were seen as property, literally property. So what happens is when you see yourself as a descendant of a slave, someone on TV who was uneducated, what happens is you begin to adopt that behavior. And that's challenging because now other people in your environment also adopt that behavior. And then what happens? This state ultimately is a cultural engineer in that if the criminal justice system is pressing upon you a war on drugs and sentencing and incarcerating vast amounts of individuals, including right here in Canada with mandatory minimum sentences, if police are intercepting you, so all the elements I mentioned in terms of the health crisis also impose a direct, I want to say tattooed mindset in, in terms of it's being etched on your identity, excuse me. It's being etched into your identity and you adopt that behavior. That behavior becomes shared within your community and ultimately a culture is born. And many of you, including myself, I wouldn't want my daughter listening to what I see on TV with the current hip hop. I wouldn't want that. And you ask yourself, how did that come to be? Well, it's pretty simple. By calling someone the N-word, by pressing upon them from every different direction, you could debase someone to a point where they themselves will call themselves the N-word. Or they themselves will adopt certain behaviors whereby, as was famously said by Charles G. Woodson, he established, the, the person that established Black History Month, he said that if you can control a man's thinking, you don't have to predict what he's going to do. If you tell him to go to the back door, he's gonna go to the back door. And if there is no back door, his very nature will create one and he'll leave. In other words, if you can press on someone long enough, you can really have an imprint upon them a diminished view of, of themselves. And this happens also in our education system, whereby it's proven that teachers who mistreat persons of color it has a real impact on their examination, on their behavior. And one of the main reasons why I went to McGill Law after my master's degree is that I was reading content that established that teachers, first of all, gave more detentions, were more severe, and impressed upon persons of color a more negative view of themselves. Also, low-income schools got low-income information. So I told myself, I was low-income, and I remember being in school with these thick textbooks from the 1980s, not learning very much. So in many ways, in my public school, I was robbed from the quality education that I think every single child in Montreal, in Quebec, and in Canada deserves. If our educational institutions do not reinforce and do not teach the emotional intelligence and the positive aspects of people's identities, well, you will have large groups of society that do not have the self-confidence or the self-respect or the dignity to lead valuable lives. 
And being a minority, I don't consider myself a minority. I don't like the word because I, I am a proud Quebecer and Jamaican. But being someone who did not fit the mythical norm and low income, I knew that my high school and the environment that I was in was not providing me with the best possible resources to excel at the highest level. And when I figured that out around the age of 18, I said, I'm going to get every single degree under the sun and equip myself with the maximum amount of knowledge and resources to ensure that I meet my fullest potential. Then I played in the CFL. I got a few degrees. I won a championship. But that was, that was, that's an outlier. And I had to work extremely, extremely, extremely hard. And actually, I left Montreal to go to the University of Ottawa to get away from what I felt was impressing upon me personally. Now, our challenge is, is that there are millions and millions of children out there, as Bob Marley would say, free yourself from mental slavery, who do not have the support systems that are needed in order for them to flourish. That is inspired by Iris Marin Young, that's inspired by Audre Lorde and Charles Taylor. And if ever you want, I spoke at length about this, but if ever you want those texts, I'm happy to send them uh, to Rabbi Lisa and, and she can uh, forward them to you in, and in regards to identity, culture, and everything I just mentioned, and also the state as a cultural engineer. Okay. Thank you for listening to that, that, uh, that long excerpt. Now, I wanna move on to, so once again, this is the chart that we are working on. Uh, we can't go through all of these elements, but I just wanna to touch on a few just to give you a small glimpse of the things that we're addressing. So sports and recreation, we need to ensure as a society that we have enough sports infrastructure, recreation and leisure as well, that in these boroughs, young boys and girls of all ages, of all backgrounds, have access to leisure, recreation, and sports. And that is fundamental to assisting and to mitigating high school dropout rates. And as you know, Quebec has the highest high school dropout rate in all of the, the nation. And when I mentioned that individuals of color, black people, black men rather, have equal degrees as the rest of the population, that does not include Saint-Michel and Montreal North. So that is the average across the board. But high school dropout rates are highest in those boroughs. And if you look at the sports infrastructure in those boroughs, it's the lowest. So you see a correlation, for example, Montreal North, which has 80,000 people, does not have a sports center. It, it, and it's, it's 2020. So in the public consultation on systemic racism, myself being a teacher, uh, being a professional athlete, sports, recreation, and leisure does not only touch on the fact that you might stay in school or have a better chance to, remedies issues of health, of mental health, and a range of other benefits, as you know, just simply providing those services right now in Montreal, uh, that is simply not the case. And before we move on to the next slide, and I see as, as time goes, I wanna mention, I mentioned culture, I mentioned racial profiling, participation in democratic life. Multiple studies indicate that if you are not represented, you, your concerns, your ambitions, your issues are not going to be recognized. What do I mean by that? There was a study conducted that analyzed legislation in Congress, and it turns out that Latinos and African Americans would draft legislation that would improve low income minority populations and ensure there was health, education, and a list of other determinants that were really focused on. What that means is that 
if you don't have a diverse democratic institution that represents the interests and the concerns of a population, well, legislation will not be differentiated to tackle those issues. And then you ask yourself, how is it that we don't have sports centers in underfunded or underprivileged boroughs in Montreal? Well, the representatives of those boroughs do not reflect the populations. Therefore, when they're at City Hall, they won't be fighting for those issues because for them, they are not necessarily aware or they might be aware, but it's not their priority on the political agenda to advance those issues. So in a healthy democracy, one of the reasons why many of these issues continue to persist is that there isn't representation at the top. Therefore, the $5 billion budget that the city has will not be allocated to those different sectors of public life. So that's something very, very important. And we know right now that the city of Montreal visible minorities at City Hall, while the total population of visible minorities in Montreal is 33%. So that puts into question the legitimacy of our democracy in many ways when the people that are representing the population don't represent them both ideologically or through their ethnicity, their nationality, their sexual orientation, et cetera. So from that perspective, it is extremely important that in a democracy, you get people to vote and people are disenchanted, they're disenfranchised, and they are not voting, especially young people, and that has to change. So when you look at the list, and we can go to housing discrimination, and, when you, and we can't touch on everything, then you ask yourself a simple question. Why are people protesting? Well, the ignition was the killing of George Floyd. However, based on the things we touched on previously, whether it's education, health determinants, racial and social profiling, identity, culture, we understand that they are protesting for what? there are underlining grievances that have never been addressed. And these underlining grievances persist and they're real. And an easy classic example is if you're a woman of color in Montreal, you make on average $30,000 a year. If you're a male, and you are not racialized, you make on average 50 and at times $60,000 a year. That brings up two points. Number one, it's a liability to be a black woman in Montreal based on the fact that you might not get hired. And even if you do, you will get cut half the salary. And number two, an important term that you should I have taken away from this course is intersectionality. So you could be a black woman that's on two levels. You could be a black woman from the LGBTQ community, that's three. And intersectionality must be taken into consideration because when we talk about gender parity, and Audre Lorde talks a lot about this, and I'll, I'm happy to send that literature. We omit the diverse characteristics of women in that discussion. So we're not going to talk about Jewish women when we talk about gender parity. We're not gonna talk about women of color when we talk about gender parity. We talk about gender parity in a homogenous way. That's challenging because then you're not aware of all the other women that are excluded from the, gen, from the gender parity conversation. So that was a, a step back in all of these elements that you see on your screen. So when you think about housing discrimination, employment, inequality, think about intersectionality. Because if you are a woman of color, 
you are more likely to be discriminated in terms of housing than if you were, say, a homogenous or a Caucasian male. So understanding that systemic discrimination is just not a unilateral, uniform um, issue, and that there are many aspects of, pub of public life across intersectional grounds, now you can get a better picture of what systemic discrimination is. And even though this is complex, I'm going to facilitate it for you on the next slide. I'm gonna ask you to do me a favor. Think for a moment, how would you define systemic discrimination, okay? So on the right, you have Edith Gilbert, and she's a Holocaust survivor. And in the article, she speaks of the pain that she has when she sees hate, hateful messages spray painted in her neighborhood, on temples, and, and around her community. And so that invokes, I'm sure you're thinking about the health determinants, you're thinking about all other factors, hate crimes, you're thinking about all different kinds of things when it comes to that, based on the things that we've established. On the bottom, you have Tanisma. He was an urbanist with a master's degree here in Montreal. He was denied a promotion from the city of Montreal. And it took him 10 years and $150,000 to win at the Human Rights Commission. Now, both of those stories insert themselves in a context of systemic discrimination. The characteristics are different, but I am, before I give you the answer of what I'm going to, how I'm gonna explain systemic discrimination, because those seem very different to you, but I'll tell you how they're very, very similar. Uh, take a few moments to define systemic racism uh, just on, on your own. I think that I have given you a lot of information, a lot of information. I'm squeezing a, a, a full course into um, 45 minutes. I'm, I'm squeezing a year's course into 45 minutes. Um, think about the, how would you define systemic racism after everything that we said? Okay, so just take a few moments you're probably, I give you a lot of information that um, you're, yeah, you're probably thinking, you know, where should you put your, but keep it simple, put it that way. I'll just give you a few minutes just to ponder. How would you define systemic racism? Okay, and, and maybe I, I will give you a simple, simple definition. And in, in, in the discussion uh, period, we can, um, we can talk about that or other aspects. So the simple definition and the easiest way to see it is the following. There are laws, protocols, and practices, and the result has a disproportionate negative impact on certain populations. So for example, the easy one we give at the beginning is Bill 21. It's a neutral law. However, the result has a disproportionate impact on the Jewish community, on the Muslim community, et cetera. Now, this is the issue, and there's a second element to that. And that's why I'm showing you the picture of Edith. The second element to it is there's a social process, a social process of thousands and thousands, if not millions and millions of people that uphold the discriminatory policies, practices, and laws and it's almost like a, it's a top down, down up effect. And in the middle, that is what you have being systemic discrimination 
or systemic discrimination in and of itself. The social process is that there could be a law that says that you could ban religious symbols, but then there are people that enact the law. There are people that might take matters into their own hands and begin to conduct hate crimes. And there's all these different elements that happen in society on a social level that uphold the institutional framework. And that's really, really important to understand. Because if someone does a graffiti on a temple, for example, someone might say, well, that's not systemic discrimination. That's just one individual act. Well, actually, that social act is taking place within a broader context of institutional discrimination, and it supports and upholds the institutional discrimination. And the, another easy example, and I'm going to give you a few just to crystallize it, is a police officer. If I'm going to interrupt just for yeah. a moment, and I'm so sorry to do it, but I want to make sure we have time for questions. Oh, okay, okay. So let's let's have the examples because I think that's so important, and then let's open it up if we could. Okay, so so re really quickly, if a police officer does an individual act on one person, that is still systemic discrimination for two main reasons. Number one, as mentioned, there there could be thousands of them committing the same act. Also, really quickly. There is a power hierarchy in play, whereby the police officer representing the state with the badge, that hierarchy of power is important to understand within the systemic discrimination context. And I'm kind of speeding through it, and you're, I just threw another curveball at you, so you might be wondering, but the power dynamic in systemic discrimination is important to understand because whether it's employment, whether it's public security or otherwise, there are always power relations and the individual at the bottom who is marginalized or oppressed, even though it might happen on an individual level, because it's happening within a hierarchical power structure, is still involved in the systemic discrimination nature of, of the definition that we're using. Okay, and I'll just really quickly go to the last point. Recommendation number one from the public consultation. I'm happy to share the public consultation recommendations and the, the, the number one word you see there is recognize. You have to be able to name and recognize the issue if you want to solve it. If you wanna solve hate crimes, you have to call it a hate crime. If you wanna solve systemic discrimination, you have to call it systemic discrimination. If you wanna solve racial profiling, whether it's in human resources or police, you have to recognize it. Once you recognize it, then you can address it, and then we could move closer towards uh, remedying some of these issues. So on that note, I'll end there and uh, I'll open up the floor to questions. I want to thank you so much and go right to questions. Um, for those who want to linger longer, Valerie, if you're able to, I'm happy for us 